Hey, I'm Caleb Howard, and welcome to Tales from Sacred Texts. This podcast is a sarcastic and story-driven narrative of myths surrounding various belief systems and ridiculous stories from the Bible, Apocrypha, and Gnostic Gospels, as well as other sacred texts, that will explore little-known facts and stories related to religion. Today, we'll be going over the Apocalypse of Peter, where we'll see Peter go on one hell of a journey in a discount Dante's Inferno type story where the punishments absolutely do not fit the crime. The Apocalypse of Peter is part of the Apocrypha and more of the fan fiction type along the lines of the Acts of Peter. It's a detailed account of Peter's journey into heaven and hell, and I'm going to take some liberties with it. It's presented almost like a list. Peter went here and saw this. Then he went here and saw this. I added some dialogue and more narration than usual to kind of smooth it out. But all the ideas of the punishments of hell are the authors of own because I don't think I could make something like this up. I'll be adding my opinions more than usual just because of the sheer horrendousness of this story and will be emphasizing that this entire book is basically in contradiction to the rest of the Bible. Like some of these things, just ugh. It's enough to make the stomach of an average human turn in disgust. Also, content warning, this is medieval hell so there's basically every possible arrangement of fire and a lot of cruelty from both God and demons. Anyway, that's about all that I'm going to say for now. At the end, I'll do a little comparison of this work with Dante's Inferno. Who am I kidding? It's going to be a constant commentary. I love Dante's Inferno for its sheer ridiculousness. One more thing. The portrayal of Jesus and the angels in this episode does not agree with the rest of the Bible or the actions of Jesus taken anywhere else. I just want you to be clear so when you say, Caleb just said Jesus was like this, know that I'm pulling all of this from the attitude the apocalypse of Peter puts across. Now... Let's get into the story. The disciples sat on the Mount of Olives. Jesus prayed for such a long time, and they got really bored. To Jesus, he was talking to his father. To the disciples, it was Jesus' dad, and to be honest, they were a bit awkward. They'd asked Jesus to teach them to pray before, but they'd already done that one. Peter, of course, being the brash and overconfident one, had an idea. They'd asked Jesus to show them a righteous person who'd already gone to heaven. Um, Simon the Zealot held his hand up. Jesus isn't just going to pull some dead people out of heaven for any reason. We've got to make it sound like we want to learn something. Peter nodded. That did seem like a good idea. Purely academic purposes. They wanted to be able to encourage other people with what heaven would be like. Jesus knew what Peter was up to, but he understood. These guys had never seen heaven or hell. That was boring. These guys were his friends. He'd show them where he hung out. Heaven first. Hell would look even scarier after heaven. Peter looked at Jesus. Where were the black people and the Hispanic people and the Asians and really anyone who had a tan? Did everyone have pale white skin and cherry red lips? How much profit was heaven's lipstick manufacturer taking in? And wow, everyone was hot, even the guys. It was all a trick of the light, okay? It was so bright that all the black people's bodies looked whiter than snow. Peter wasn't buying it. Heaven seemed, well, not very diverse, especially with the disciples being Jews and of various shades of color, and he was getting a bit worried. But he would like those cherry red lips, ruddy faces, and that just that impossible hotness. Good characters are good looking. Bad people are hideous. What was that, Jesus? Peter asked. It was just a trope he'd heard in mythology. He thought it might carry over into heaven and hell, but he wasn't sure. He hadn't seen heaven and hell since he became a human. Peter had more questions, though. Who were these guys? Out of any question you could have asked. Jesus shook his head. The disciples had asked to see some people who had died and gone to heaven. Shining people appeared. These were the people who died and gone to heaven. That just made sense. He didn't even see how this was a question. 
Before their eyes, a breathtakingly beautiful land appeared where the extremely beautiful people lived uh, along extremely beautiful angels. The flowers never faded, various kinds of plants and fruits grew, and everyone was singing praises to God. This is heaven, Jesus said. The disciples knew that much. It looked like every stereotype of heaven ever. Jesus was disappointed. He was looking forward to the big reveal, but he was happy to announce this is where high priests and good people live, despite the fact that the high priests were currently planning to murder him and were probably the most likely candidates for hell, seeing as they literally murdered God. The disciples weren't sure about that. They thought that the high priests were the bad guys. Not in this book, Jesus said. Before Peter had much time to think on this, they were sinking, sinking down into a dark place, full of infernal fires, noisome smells, and pitiful wails. The wails and shrieks grew louder as they sank deeper and deeper into this monstrous cavern. They were looking at hell. So, are there like nine circles or something, each one getting progressively worse, and the punishments oddly fitting the crime in horrifying ways? Oh no, Jesus said. Absolutely not. It's really just a hodgepodge of arbitrary punishments. This book really reminds me of when I was a kid and would read a book that I really liked and would try to copy my favorite parts of it down in my own writing. I was writing novels when I was like seven years old and they were mostly stuff that I had compiled from works I had just read. But they never really turned out that great and they were mere shadows of the original book and just felt kind of trite. It feels like this Apocalypse of Peter was just written by a seven-year-old kid who read Dante's Inferno and loved it, but didn't have the patience to structure it correctly. Okay, ran over. Back to the story. Oh, wow. Peter gasped. That was pretty bad. These people were being hanged by their tongues. He looked away. Jesus laughed. He thought that was bad? I mean, he should hear what these people did. What did they do? Peter shuddered. Did they speak out on behalf of a political candidate from the wrong political party? And, you know, tongues and all, they weren't allowed to speak now. Jesus shook his head. Two thousand years later, politics would take over the church, but now the government hated all Christians, so not really any politics involved. These were blasphemers. They claim to be God or be able to forgive sins. Peter nodded. That was pretty bad. He got the whole hang by tongues thing now. But they got fire burning under them too? That was a bit of overkill, like two punishments at one time. Jesus gestured toward the lake a little way, with a flaming swamp at one side of it. The people there got torturing angels. They could go over there if they wanted Peter went over there and asked the torturing angel, who was wearing black robes and looked just generally evil, how he got the job. That didn't really sound like a good job for an angel. The angel nodded. It's, it's rough. None of us want these jobs, but there's always people to torture. Peter didn't understand. The sinners were already in a flaming swamp. Just do a little magic so the people couldn't get out. Also, what crime did these guys commit? Angel shook his head. They tried to pass their own idea of what was right for gods. They basically just did what they thought was good. Like, they went around and killed everyone who read the Bible or disagreed with the church during the Middle Ages? Religious intolerance, that kind of thing? Nope, more of just some light deception and a little bit of sex outside of marriage. Ugh, that was enough to get them their own torturing angel? Peter didn't understand how the angels could stand this. The angel shrugged. Who else could do it? All those legends that God used demons to do this kind of work? That would be like Christmas every day of the year for the demons. Except not Christmas because that was really bad news for the demons. They were demons. They loved torturing people. It'd be like paying a gamer to play video games. Video games? What were those? Peter didn't know. He didn't, did kind of understand the whole demons thing. These demons kind of deserve to be punished for basically causing all the pain suffering and havoc in the whole world. Still, a torturing angel? How barbaric. (music) 
Peter gasped. He had turned around and saw a woman hang by her hair, feet in the bubbling, flaming swamp. Want to guess what her crime was? Jesus asked. Given this time period, Peter said, probably just for being attractive. Jesus nodded. Close. They made themselves look attractive so they could commit adultery. Are you sure this doesn't include women who just dressed nice and got raped? Jesus looked around, embarrassed. Billions of people in the world, there is sure to be a few small mistakes. Not to worry, though. He gestured toward the men hanging up next to the women. They get the same punishment. They just get hanged by the feet. Neither sound very good. Let's move on, Peter said. Before long, they came to a pit filled with evil snakes. Peter wasn't sure what the difference between an evil snake and a good snake was, but the pit was said to be filled with evil ones. It was a wacky, horrifying place of torment. This was nothing out of the ordinary for hell. What was out of the ordinary was that the men and women writhing in agony as the snakes constantly bit them. Who were these? Peter asked. Murderers, Jesus said. Peter didn't really get how the snakes fit in with a crime, because the murderers struck people from a hiding spot, kind of like poisonous snakes. That's as good of explanation as any, Jesus said. He gestured toward some people standing nearby, watching the murderers suffer. These were their victims. These victims continually stood around, saying that the murderer's punishment was fair. Peter didn't really understand why these guys were here. They had a whole new lease on life and could presumably go to heaven instead of sitting in hell and watching the unceasing torture of their murderers. Wasn't there a point where people should let go of their revenge and hatred? Jesus shrugged. The whole father forgive them thing wasn't for everyone. If these guys wanted to watch their murderers get bit by snakes for all eternity, they had that option. Well, they could watch these guys getting bitten by snakes, but honestly, it was really getting pretty disturbing. Peter, like most non-psychopaths, didn't particularly care to watch people get tortured. Jesus started walking. I have a lot more to show you. They stopped at another pit, filled with blood, filth, and all kinds of disgusting stuff. The pit was filled with women, buried up to their necks in this stuff. They were surrounded by crying children, spitting fire into their eyes. Like actual painful fire, not rap mixtape fire, Peter asked. Jesus pointed at the children spitting actual fire. Yes, that's exactly what it looked like, and he could tell from the woman's screams alone, right? Peter just didn't want to think that these to children were torturing the women. That was kind of dark. Not when you hear what the women did, Jesus said. They aborted these children. Peter didn't really get the whole punishment. First, the moms aborted the babies, sometimes in a moment when they didn't feel like they had an option and when it was societally pretty acceptable. Then, the babies, like, had to torture them for all eternity? Eternity is really long. Like a bird takes one grain of sand from a mountain, a million miles high and a million miles wide, every million years, and in the eons, about 5 times 10 to the 43 third power years, it takes the mountain to be worn away. That is just the first second of eternity. Jesus knew what James Joyce was going to write. He didn't need Peter to tell it to him. Peter nodded. It really did make sense, though. Did the punishment really fit the crime, especially for someone who just cheated on their spouse, never was sorry for it, and then got hung by the hair over burning fire for an unfathomable amount of time? I mean, it was really not a nice thing to do, but did they deserve that punishment? Jesus was really angry. You're attacking the foundation of Christianity. Peter looked at him incredulously. He was supposed to be merciful, kind, and fair. This was none of that. This was horrendous and really demonic. Even psychopaths eventually tor tired of torturing their victims. I'm just going to interject my opinion in here. On the bright side, none of this is biblical at all. Hell isn't eternal, and the whole idea that it was is really horrendous. Authors like James Joyce have rightly seen this flaw with the classic belief in hell which is horrifying and portrays God as a monster. I know some people will take up this debate with me and I'm absolutely ready to debate them on this. The idea of hell as eternally burning was primarily created to bring uneducated people under the jackboot of tyranny. But for this episode, that's all I'm going to say. I am just getting horrified with the whole idea of even thinking of eternal hell. 
Peter also didn't know what to say about the babies. Jesus was involving children in this whole thing. Instead of spending their lives in heaven and taking advantage of the time they never had, their entire eternity was going to be spitting flames into the eyes of their mothers. The babies didn't get what was wrong with this. Torturing people was totally normal. The demons, though, the demons were having a big problem with this. Listen, we have no problem taking the most innocent humans, young children, and overwhelming their pure hearts with darkness, but we thought that was our job. God literally took away from us the one thing we are good at by doing it himself first. Doesn't that kind of prove the point that God is no better than us? Jesus shrugged. He did what he wanted. He was God. The demons had to obey him, whether they liked it or not. Can we just move on, Peter asked. He got that Jesus was going to involve the aborted babies, putting them in hell as torturers for the sins of their parents. Can we just forget about this? This is horrendous. Fine, Jesus said, muttering something about humans and how they just couldn't understand the dealings of God. We'll continue our journey through hell and its horrendous and unfair punishments, but that will be right after this. So, what's anchor? It's that thing you throw off your ships into the water. Also, it's the easiest and best way to make a podcast. I'd been wanting to make a podcast for forever, but I had no clue how to get started. That was before I downloaded Anchor. Anchor provides you with the tools to record and edit your podcast, as well as add those things like music and transitions that are crucial in getting your podcast off the ground. Anchor even matches you with sponsors, no matter how many listeners your podcast currently has or doesn't have. It comes in the form of a sleek app or website produced by Spotify, if that gives you an idea of how good it looks, and it handles distributions to all the major podcast platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher so that you don't have to deal with the hassle. A podcast tool like this must be real expensive, right? Nope. It's the cheapest podcast tool there is. Absolutely free. All you have to do is just download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started absolutely free today. Peter shrank back in horror. This was the worst thing he'd seen yet. These guys were getting a red hot poker shoved into their eyes again and again and again. This was awful. Maybe the people who looked at porn, Peter guessed? Oh, that would have been a nice one. Jesus clapped him on the back. Actually, it's people who talk bad about serving God. I don't get it. Eyes? Talking bad? What? Listen, Dante just had a little too much time on his hand. We had to create all the punishments of hell really quick. There was a, we didn't expect there to be that many sinners and that so many sins and all. We just kind of wrote down the worst things we could think of and drew punishments out of a hat. There's not much correlation at all. But those people over there, they've got fire in their mouths and they were also false witnesses and false accusers. Like that kind of relates. Fire, mouths, you know? Absolutely by chance. Although it's kind of a good one, don't you think? Basically the whole hell is just firing, torturing angels and we can mix it up a little bit and the murderers do get snakes, but there's only so many combos we can have. Like the people who charge high interest on the poor, they're just over there standing up to their knees in blood and pitch. Their knees? For trying to take advantage of the people in the worst circumstances? That's a little light. I mean, come on. Those guys that just said some bad things about God here and there are getting a red hot poker jam in their eyes. Peter shuddered. Wait, I thought you said demons don't work here. Peter gestured to some people in a dark place, being constantly beaten by demons as they were devoured from the inside by worms. Okay, you caught me, God said. We had to go with a temp hiring agency. We couldn't get enough angels to volunteer for the job. How are we to know that the guys who said they loved torturing people so much were evil demons? It didn't make sense. Surely there were good people that loved torture. No, no there weren't, Peter said. No half-decent person thinks that people should be tortured forever for the mistakes or even purposeful evil done over the course of a mere blip in eternity. Jesus looked at Peter. You're my friend. I'll ignore that one. That's talking bad about God, and I don't think you want a red-hot poker in your eyes. Peter shuddered and pretended to be interested in all the punishments of hell again. This one's pretty nice, he said. Rolling around in sharp, red-hot pebbles, what did they do? They were rich and didn't give their money away to the poor. Oh, makes sense, Peter said. Again, I don't get the sharp, red-hot pebbles, but I know that punishments are relatively random here. 
Jesus smiled. Peter was getting it. I think I've learned my lesson, Peter said. Disobeying you is a really dangerous thing. Can we go now? I've got one more to show you, Jesus said. They walked past a group of people beating each other with rods in a sea of fire. They were the people that made idols for themselves. Jesus, Peter interrupted. How are these guys continually beating each other with rods? Why don't they stop? I'm God, Jesus reminded. I can control their bodies so they are forced to constantly hit each other. Ugh. They stopped at the base of a huge mountain. Angels and demons both were driving them up to the top of the mountain where they were thrown from the cliff at the top and then picked up by the angels and demons repeated over and over and over again. What did these people do? Maybe they were like, you know, the kinds of people who would convince people that they had to do good works and whip themselves in penance to be saved, only to let those people down quite suddenly when they die and realize that's not what saves them. Jesus shook his head. One, good works and penance absolutely save people. Two, I told you, there are no cruel punishments fitting the crime here. These are the LGBT people. Wait, that's awful. How does that even fit? Peter asked. No cruel punishments, Jesus reminded. Also, here's the way marriage works. If the guy wants a girl, the guy gets the girl. She doesn't get any choice in the matter. It doesn't matter who the girl is into or if the guy is into other guys. That's the way it will work for the next 2,000 years. Peter looked toward Jesus again. Since we know they'll be given this horrible punishment for all eternity, shouldn't we have at least the decency to bake them some cakes? Absolutely not, Jesus told him. Whatever you do, don't you ever bake them a cake. This was horrible. Could we go now? Peter looked around, and as far as the eye could see, there were people, end quote, turning and burning and roasting. He couldn't stand it anymore. Just think what it would be like if you were one of those people, Jesus said. Those are the people that changed their mind about serving me. And just as suddenly as it had started, it was over, and Peter rose from the fiery chasm of hell out into the fresh, pure air of late fall. Peter shuddered in horror. Jesus, the kind and peaceable friend he had known so well, had a basement where he horrifically tortured people for all eternity. How could he be sure about anything about trusting this guy anymore? So that's basically the end of the Apocalypse of Peter. We don't have the whole book, just a fragment, so it kind of stops right in the middle of the journey through hell. The idea of Jesus being so kind to his disciples while having an infernal torture chamber below the earth is pretty horrendous, and far from being an adequate punishment for sin, the punishments don't fit the crime. We're not talking Dante style here. Although Dante's creative punishments show all the characteristics of a horror fiction author without some of the narrative skill. We are talking that some people who have said a couple bad things about God have poker shoved in their eyes for all eternity. Eternal hellfire is inherently unjust. But that's all about that. I'm going to say that about that for now. We're going to talk about Dante for just a moment before we close out the episode. Dante's Inferno is a much more structured version of the Apocalypse of Peter, explicitly influenced by Greek mythology and aimed at producing a work of art above creating a spiritual message. Hence, the symmetry of the nine circles, the poetic justice or injustice, however you like to see it, of the punishments, and the detail given. On the other hand, the Apocalypse of Peter is primarily to strike fear into people and to describe what the author believes is a realistic picture of hell. Therefore, it is very straightforward, includes little detail, and does not mention any of the names of the people in hell. In contrast, Dante mentions names of his political opponents, people he didn't like, historical figures, and really anyone he could think of as condemned to suffer in hell, even people that he liked because they didn't serve God. There are many cultural references that establish Dante as a learned individual, although he is definitely going for that vibe. The sins Dante lists are also more likely to be serious and more well-described. Hypocrites, thieves, corrupt politicians, and greedy— Although, Dante pretty much includes all the sins described in the Apocalypse of Peter as well, and condemns anyone who did not know about God to hell, despite the fact that the Bible is clear that some people that did not know about God will be saved. As such, there are some redeeming entertainment qualities to Dante's Inferno. The Apocalypse of Peter has no such qualities. Still, I view the Apocalypse of Peter to be interesting in its own right, because it was written to be taken seriously, and attempts to establish its definition of hell as that portrayed by Jesus Christ. Also, it's just another opportunity to engage in some moderate to heavy sarcasm. Anyway, that's all for this week. 
Next week, we're going to be doing something a little different. We'll be doing the biblical story of Judas, the archetypical traitor, and we're going to be going over what the Bible says about his treachery. What were his motivations, and why did everyone seem to trust him so much? Also, what makes the kind of person that was handpicked by Jesus turn evil, and what can we do to lock up the darkness in our own lives? It will be an interesting discussion, and I hope you'll join us for it next week. Afterward, we'll be getting back to our typical stories. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. If you want to help us out more, please share us with your friends. That's all for this week, and I'll see you next time. Scripting is done by myself, and music is by myself and Anchor Podcasts. Have a great rest of the week. So, that's basically the end of the Apocalypse of Peter. We don't have the whole book, just a fragment, so it kind of stops right in the middle of the journey through hell. The idea of Jesus being so kind to his disciples while having an infernal torture chamber below is pretty horrendous, and far from being an adequate punishment for sin, the punishments really don't fit the crime. We're not talking Dante style here. Although Dante's creative punishments show all the characteristics of a horror fiction author without some of the narrative skill. We are talking that people who have said a couple bad things about God have poker shoved in their eyes for all eternity. Eternal hellfire is inherently unjust. We're going to talk about Dante for just a moment before we close out the episode. Dante's Inferno is a much more structured version of the Apocalypse of Peter, explicitly influenced by Greek mythology and aimed at producing a work of art above conveying a spiritual message. Incidentally, some of the ideas for Christian hell came from Greek mythology, and that's why it's really interesting that Dante incorporates that into his work. But because of the emphasis on portraying a work of art, you see the symmetry of the nine circles, the poetic justice, or injustice, however you like to see it, of the punishments, and the detail given. On the other hand, the apocalypse of Peter is primarily to strike fear into people and to describe what the author believes is a realistic picture of hell. Therefore, it is very straightforward, includes little detail, and does not mention any names of the people in hell. In contrast, Dante mentions names of his political opponents, people he did not like, historical figures, and even people he admired to suffer in hell. There are many cultural references that establish Dante as a learned individual, and I think that he was definitely going after that vibe when he wrote The Inferno. The sins Dante lists include a lot more serious and well-described sins, Hypocrites, thieves, corrupt politicians, and greedy people are all listed, although Dante does also include all the sins pretty much described in the Apocalypse of Peter. He includes suicide as a sin, some other stuff, and he also condemns everyone who does not know God to hell, despite the fact that the Bible is clear that some people who did not know about God would be saved. But there are some redeeming entertainment qualities to Dante's Inferno, mainly the ones that I just mentioned. But the Apocalypse of Peter does not possess those qualities. Still, I am interested by the Apocalypse of Peter because it was written, I believe, to be taken seriously, and it attempts to establish its own definition of hell and convince people that that definition of hell was portrayed by Jesus Christ. Also, it's just another opportunity to engage into some moderate to heavy sarcasm. Anyway, that's all for this week. In two weeks, we're going to be doing something a little different. We'll be doing the biblical story of Judas, the archetypical traitor, and we're going to be going over what the Bible says about his treachery. What were his motivations, and why did everyone seem to trust him so much? Also, what makes the kind of person that was handpicked by Jesus Christ turn evil, and what can we do to lock up the darkness in our own lives? It will be an interesting discussion, and I hope you'll join it for us next time. Afterward, we'll be getting back to our typical stories with another installment in the quest for the promised land.